it awesome? Spring I.O. in Barcelona again. Great to see you all again. It's so good to be back in a real conference, not this Zoom call, online, whatever stuff. And Oli and me, we are pretty excited. And also give some round of applause to the amazing organizers here who set this thing up and had to go through some rough times. And yeah, so this idea for the talk has been already brewing in our minds for, I would say, three years or something. We actually wanted to do it at uh, Spring I.O. In, um, in Barcelona in 2020, was it? 20, right? right? So now is the time, and um, we briefly introduce ourselves. My name is Michael Plöd. I work at a company called InnoQ. Mostly do a lot of the main-driven design stuff. But my spring experience also dates back to the 1.x days. And um, yeah, that's about me and Oliver. Um, hi, I'm Oli. I'm working for the spring team at VMware. I've been working mostly in the data area, founded the spring data projects back in 2010 or 11. It's been a while. Um, I've moved on to like more architecture focused topics um, for quite a while now. And that's why we're doing this talk, basically. Michael and me. Um, go ahead. A lot of the stuff that you're going to hear in the talk is going to be in some book that I'm currently writing on. Uh, it was supposed to be finished like last year already, but you know, right, there's this thing happening, the pandemic. Um, but if you're interested, there's a, a Twitter account for it. Oh, if you Google this, the thing. Um, right, so that's it. Um, as Michael said, this talk is just the entry point for like two other talks that we're planning. So we, we went to Sergi in 22, uh, 2020. We're like, okay, we have this idea, right? We want to do these three talks where this one that you're currently in sets kind of the foundation about like how do you actually implement modules and modularity with Spring. So we want to talk about the foundations of modularity. What does that even mean? How do you, uh, what, what kind of um, means do you apply to find the right modules? And I'm going to go, that's, that's what Michael's going to do just right now, basically. I'm going to do in some technical details more, like how do you actually project the logical modules into some physical space. Excuse me. Better now, hopefully. Okay. Ah, nice. Uh, thank you. Um, I'm going to basically talk how we actually map that stuff onto the technological space, like processes, artifacts, packages, what, what have you. And each of us is going to go into details of both the stuff that we, we talk about in uh, tomorrow in two additional talks where Mike is going to talk about how to actually like, use domain-driven design to find the right modules for your domain. And in the evening, it's actually the last slot, so we're going to have uh, quite some fun there, I hope. Um, I'm going to talk about like, how to like, make use of spring technologies to actually uh, implement those in detail, right? So all the technical deep dive parts are uh, in that in that session tomorrow. And with that, Michael? Yeah, I'm ready. Please go ahead. Okay, so now let's dive back into a lot of the basics, yeah? Modularity. I, I guess, who of you thinks and knows something about modularity? Raise your hand. Yeah, I see a lot of raised hands. However, if I look at my customers, which I'm consulting, yeah, I sometimes see modularity done wrong or being not so modular. And um, in, in the first part, in the first 20, 25 minutes, what I want to do is I want to give, uh, revisit some basics, yeah, like, like a little bit going back to university, but I hope in a sort of an entertaining way for you folks. And I would say, Let's look at a conference, yeah? some IT conference, maybe the amazing Spring I.O. in 2022. Yeah, there is some stuff going on, like you signed up for a ticket, you paid your ticket, or your employer paid the ticket. Um, the, Sergi and his team, they were doing the lunch planning, how much food do we need, how many vegetarians and vegans and meat eaters do we expect at the conference. Um, there's some planning on rooms. Yeah, for instance, uh, a couple of years ago, it happened to me that I was at some other conference doing a call, uh, a talk, and in parallel to me, Rod Johnson was doing a talk as well. Rod Johnson, for those who are new to the Spring Space, is one of the or the inventor of the Spring Framework, basically. And 
the organizers mixed it up a bit. I was in the biggest venue and Rod was in a very small room and it should have been exactly the other way around. So stuff like that shouldn't happen. And we also print the badges. Yeah, you all received those badges here. Yeah, you know the stuff. And yeah, all of these things, they involve you as visitors or attendees of that conference. And haven't we all heard about this good old dry principle? Don't repeat yourself. Sometimes a good, uh, a good idea, yeah? reuse, is not a bad thing per se, but sometimes this may also be the root of some evil in some applications. Yeah? So let's come up with a model for that. The customer that can do everything. This is a perfect thing. It can do everything. This has a high degree of reuse. Yeah? We can expose it with a RESTful HTT, as a RESTful HTTP resource. Get, put, post, delete. Well, maybe sometimes it would be more honest if you pass the clients of that resource the database credentials, yeah? when we pass all the attributes to the clients. And so let's talk about some basic design principles here. So one of the first things is separation of concern, SOC, yeah? where we want to divide a complex system according to some responsibility along some concerns that we have. Yeah? And I think we are already doing this in a very, very good manner on a an horizontal, aka technical level. Yeah? Don't we all work with layered architectures, with the ideas between hexagonal architectures, clean architecture, onion architecture, you name it. I think separation of concerns on technical and horizontal levels is something that we're doing pretty well. But how about the vertical layer, the domain layer? Yeah? How are we doing separation of concerns there? Do we have good modules for domain concerns? Let's see. You remember this one. I wouldn't call that model here a separation of concerns. I'd rather call that a consolidation of concerns. So we squeeze a bunch of capabilities, a bunch of concerns into one big central model so that we can go to our managers and say, hey, we have a high degree of reuse on those things. Awesome. But on which parts do we have the reuse? Yeah. Now, these things here, which you've also seen, and which you've also had some experience in context of the Spring I.O. conference, are some stuff yeah, that are domain concerns. Maybe we want to separate this thing into those concerns. And we can group them into something like ticket sales, event management, and badges, maybe. Maybe those are module candidates on a vertical level. Yeah. And I would say this, this concept of modularity can be seen as a specialization in terms of this whole separation of concerns idea. Let's revisit modularity a little bit. What do we want to do there? The intention is, yeah? basically that's a specialization, as I already said, in terms of uh, separation of concerns. So we want to separate a big chunk of software into several smaller components, which we can call modules. The goal is that we want to achieve a high degree of independence so that um, we don't know, we don't want to know all the intrinsic details of other modules. And we want to have a clear contract. Why? Because this can raise independence. And you can scale this up or down to various concerns. You can have very fine-grained modules, or you can even have bigger modules, such something like a microservice. Yeah? But a microservice that exposes all of its internals runs the danger that everyone is running on those internals, uh, internals that the coupling raises. Now, and the advantage is yeah? we want to have an interchangeability. We want to have independence. We want to run changes yeah, without modifications to the interface. 
maybe on an organizational level, yeah, we want to even be able to change parts of a mod model or of a module without talking to a different team. Yeah. So cross-team coordination can be reduced with that idea. Yeah. And a very, very important thing, I want to be able to test those modules in isolation in an independent fashion yeah? and not run tons of integration tests and have a tiny little amount of unit tests. Yeah? A key concept for that is information hiding. Yeah? And so I want to protect the internal data yeah? and some internal logic with information hiding. Think about an electric vehicle. Let's say you take a Tesla Model 3. So it has a huge battery. And that battery consists of tons of small battery cells. Do you, as a consumer who is driving the Tesla, really want to know about the charging status of every single cell in that car, in the floor of that car? I would say my brain capacity is limited in a way that I couldn't present process this plethora of data that I get there. No, I want to know, is my car charged at 90%, at 50%, and how far can I go with that charge, for instance? So I don't want to know about all the intrinsic details of those small modules. And I would say every programming language has visibility operators, public, private, package private, protected, and so on. You know them. I'm pretty sure that everyone knows those. So modules hide internals and expose interfaces. What does that mean? Let's grab this event management module here. I would say this API here, get lunch preferences, get amount of vegans, set amount of vegans, get lunch preferences, get meat eaters, set amount of meat eaters, and so on, or session interest equals new session interest, set speaker, set title, and so on. That's not information hiding. I'd call that data provisioning, yeah? data exposure. Yeah? Because the consumers of this thing, they need to know about all the details. So when do we have a valid session interest? How do we compute, for instance, the forecast for the lunch planning so that Sergi, the organizer of that conference, can go to the caterer and say, hey, we expect 1,000 folks on the first day, 1,100 folks on the second day for lunch break, and um, please make sure that the vegans don't run a shitstorm on me on Twitter. Yeah? Um, sometimes they tend to do that. I can do that. I can say that because <laughs> I'm among them. <laughs> so, and one thing, yeah, what I very often see is teams going ahead and writing classes with private attributes, and then comes the IDE shortcut straightly from the gates of hell. Generate public getters and setters. Oh, we have private attributes. We're doing information hiding there. No, you don't. No, this says you're lying to yourselves. Yeah, you, you, you proclaim of doing information hi hiding. And let me state something very provocative here. Let me provoke a little bit. Why is this even an IDE shortcut? From a domain perspective, for, from, from a perspective of writing domain code, writing getters and setters has to hurt your fingers. Yeah? So that you think every time, do I really want to do that? I'm sarcastic a bit. I'm exaggerating a little bit here yeah? for entertainment purposes or something like that. But think about that. Yeah? Um, let's take a, a look at an alternative approach. Yeah? Maybe add meal preference, retrieve catering forecast, subscribe for session, unsubscribe from session. Propose a session plan. Those are capabilities. Those are higher level, this is a higher level functionality, which a module should expose in my eyes. Yeah? And I think this thing is what modularity is all about. Just some food for thought here. 
If you say a module consists of a bunch of classes, does every class of a module really need to be public? If I look at code bases, I see 90%, 95%, sometimes even 100% of classes being public. What's the default class visibility in Java? It's package protected, and I think it's package protected for a reason. So, dear IDEs, let me rant again a little bit. Why is public class visibility a default in many new class templates? Why? Wouldn't it be better to go with package protected and then change accordingly when you need it? I think it would educate many developers to a better programming st style with information hiding yeah, in mind. Now, loose coupling is something that we want to achieve here yeah, by hiding information, by offering less coupling points. Yeah. Now, one thing, yeah, and what you should be aware of are there's a bunch of coupling types. Most of us, yeah, including me sometimes, we see direct references as coupling. But for instance, uh, David Parnas said, you can have a call coupling, notification coupling, coupling on generation, coupling on ownership, but there are many, many more types like inheritance, data structures, runtime environment, timely coupling, and so on. Let me give you an example. Are there some dog lovers here? Yeah, I'm pretty sure some of you own a dog. Let's discuss Let's discuss coupling on the example of a dog. So, that's my dog. He's called Mops. And if, you, if I implement my dog, dog, get body, get tail, dot wave. Does this piece of code offer low coupling? I don't think so. Let's revisit that. There are some dogs who don't have a tail. So, dog, get body, get tail, dot wave, throws a null pointer exception because there is no tail. Yeah, you're laughing. Look at a lot of the code bases out there. They do exactly that. So, do you really think, so how do we compensate that? We need to implement a null check. If dog get body, get tail, isn't null, then body dot wave. Otherwise, body, get feet, jump around, is a mean to express joy for the dog. Yeah? So, let's discuss coupling here again. In this example here, we don't just couple on the internals of a dog that we need to know if the dog has a tail or not. We also couple on the behavior of the dog. So the client, the consumer, needs to know how the dog expresses joy. Yeah? So you leak a lot of that knowledge to the consumer side. Just a, a quick hint, there is a law of Demeter. I'm not a big fan of this law of. Maybe see it as an honest hint of Demeter. Yeah? Something like that. Yeah? Which, which can be checked in uh, sonar and whatever. So that says objects should only communicate with objects in their immediate environment. This stock example is not a communication with objects in the immediate environment here. So, the next thing that is very important for modules is high cohesion. Yeah? Loose coupling and high cohesion. How often haven't you heard that? Yeah? What does that mean? So that we should pack stuff into a module that belongs together. Yeah? So we need to think, how do we cut that module? How do we design that module? And we need to make design decisions here on cohesion criteria. And yeah, what, what we have here in, the, in this example on that side. On the one hand, yeah, on, the, on the left one, yeah, we have a high degree of coupling and also a low degree of cohesion. For instance, look at the connections between 1, 2, and 3 in component A. Yeah, there's not many connections to them. 
but a lot of connections to the outside world. Yeah? The example on the right visualizes more of an example of tight coupling, uh, high cohesion, and loose coupling. Yeah? So one question is, how do you identify those module boundaries? Yeah? I think a good choice would be cohesion criteria. And cohesion criteria, choosing for cohesion criteria, is a design decision which often involves the answer, it depends. It depends is always the right answer. So, but please take one thing away from that talk. When you say it depends, you also need to say on what. Yeah? And in this case, we have many right design, right design decisions. Yeah? We can group things by shape by color, by text, by size. Now, what's the right thing? We don't know. We need to find out. And you have a bunch of possible criteria yeah? in, a, in a more specific manner, like business activities, data, change frequency, size, volume. Yeah? Oliver will also talk about quality criteria, maybe quality criteria, maybe a very important thing, hardware, database, middleware, and so on. And be relaxed with that. George E.P. Box once said, all models are wrong, but some of them are useful. So your major task here is to be to discard the non-useful stuff, to throw that away, and then proceed on the useful, uh, I would say, cohesion criteria. Pre be prepared to iterate over that. Yeah? And one part yeah, that can help you with that is a methodology called domain-driven design. And that's not new stuff. Domain-driven design is 19 years old. 19 years. It's crazy, isn't it? Nowadays, is more relevant than ever. Um, there's specific conferences being run on domain-driven design. And I think domain-driven design, on the one hand, has great modularization concepts, ideas like the bounded context or aggregates. And it also offers an iterative approach, which includes domain experts, which can help you to dissect, to identify good um, cohesion criteria. Yeah? So one idea for that is the DDD starter modeling process. Yeah? That's a community effort. This thing is Creative Commons. You can go on GitHub slash DDD crew and download every, everything from that. There is a big repository that describes this process that tells you what to do, and especially in terms of identifying modules, those five elements here, discovery, decomposition, connecting, definition, and the co-part, can help you in identifying solid and good vertical module candidates. Yeah? And one idea is, for instance, the bounded context. I'm pretty sure some of you have heard the term Design your micro or align your microservices along bounded context, for instance. So bounded context can be a very good uh, candidate for, um, I would say, uh, microservices. And another idea is uh, the idea of uh, the aggregate on a lower level. Yeah? That understands a graph of objects, which is a consistency boundary for rules in a domain which need to run consistently together. Who's interested in that? join my talk tomorrow, because there we will do a 50-minute deep dive in everything related to domain-driven design. It's on at 12.30 to 13.20. And I would like now to hand over to Oliver. Um, thanks, Michael, You're for that introduction. And now we have that done, and we kind of got a little bit of insight into how we approach this in general. Uh, and I can just recommend to join us tomorrow. I would like to spend a couple of minutes on thinking about how we actually take those logical things that we have, the logical modules, bound contexts, modules, however you call them, um, into the, I call it, try to describe it as physical space, although it's kind of a bit tricky like, to talk about something physical when you talk about software, right? But stuff you can actually execute, right? Post-its, unfortunately, don't run in production, I've heard. So, you have to go and translate that stuff into, into code. And um, so the question I like, uh, uh, try to put some, some light on is, like, how do we map 
one to the other. And there's a couple of criteria that I want to basically make up to uh, discuss the individual levels that we could try to apply modules to, right? If we, um, let's have a look at them first. So what kind of means do we have to build encapsulation, right? So how can we separate the inside from the outside? What does that particular level uh, offer me at, at that very level? Um, how, do, how do these things interact? So assuming, I, you, you've seen I had processes, artifacts, packages. Assuming we have multiple of those, what are the means of interaction? And what are, what the, what are the um, implications of those means, right? What, what does that mean for, for how do I design the interaction? Um, what are the effects of the distribution? So we could go from one process to multiple processes or from one artifact to multiple artifacts, and that has some kind of consequences. We're going to look at that. Um, how do we align teams to those? Is it easy to align teams with those, or does it actually create a lot of effort, right? Um, the degree of techno technological freedom, quality requirements, and last but not least, that's probably what you're most interested in. Um, the, what kind of support does the Spring ecosystem give you for exactly that that layer of abstraction. So, um, we're going to start with our system. We build a system, and that system is usually comprised of one or more processes, right? If we're in the monolithic style of, of architecture, we build exactly one process to run. Um, if we build, we could also go ahead and build multiple uh, processes to comprise the system. Uh, some companies even like go pretty crazy on that with hundreds and thousands of, of processes. But essentially it's like one or multiple ones, right? So there's a one-to-end relationship between the, the two. And um, yeah, for the, for the uh, encapsulation part, it's basically APIs. So as it's individual processes, they are kind of forced to talk uh, to each other via the network. So we actually have to actively expose APIs through some network uh, mechanisms. Like, HTTP, like GRCP, RSocket. Uh, we could also publish events to some message broker, which usually under the covers is some of the other uh, technologies, but it's kind of a different style of architecture in this case. Um, we can either directly invoke the other process, right? So we can issue an HTTP call, or can just like publish a message to a broker and basically hope, pray in some cases, uh, that the other systems react appropriately, right? Again, different kinds of uh, kind of uh, means here that we could make make use of. Um, if we start distributing the system, um, there's all kinds of challenges um, coming up, right? Just behind that tiny little word network here, there's like horror stories and, and in in terms of like the, the, the software architecture. Um, don't underestimate that that kind of effect, right? Just building distributed systems is hard. Um, I've just mentioned deserialization and serialization. It's each call, each exchange between the system is getting kind of expensive, at least compared to the alternatives that we're going to see. Um, it's pretty easy, or why do people do that if it's so full of challenges? Uh, because you can align teams around them nicely, right? So you can, in theory, if you do it properly and correctly, then um, it's kind of, you, you get to a stage, a state where the teams don't necessarily have to talk to each other much, except for coordinating the API uh, um, or the, the interchange between the individual processes. You can also just organize the code in different repositories. It's just a no-brainer, basically, right? You need um, runtime composition. That's kind of the, the thing here, right? It's not even like a, a, a dedicated step of composition. It's more of like things like the service discovery and um, yet yeah, services just finding each other. I mean. Just think about the, the web as an example, right? We kind of, we don't know whether a website existed yesterday. We just, we're just able to find it by using its like logical name, like a domain or what have you. Um, right. So we can, as we're using different processes, we can literally run everything that we can run on our platform. So it doesn't really matter whether it's Java, whether it's C Sharp, whether it's Node or JavaScript or what have you. Um, database technologies could be like completely separate. There's nothing that, kind of actively forces us to, to agree on something, which is kind of helpful with, especially uh, if t different teams face different requirements and, and what have you. Um, and 
And another argument often made for that separation on the process level is that we can individually scale the systems, right? We can isolate them from each other. So one application is not stealing memory that another application might use, like if you just deployed, I mean, if you're old enough to remember the days when we actually deployed applications into an application server, right? And like multiple ones into one application server, right? And one of them had a memory leak and basically brought down all the others. These kind of things. Although you have to say not every scalability requirement requires like a separate system, right? Especially when it comes to things that are cacheable, you could just easily put a cache in front of a monolithic application, just cache the particular route pretty aggressively. I mean, just as kind of the, the route actually has to uh, support that, but um, I just want to get across that just because you need to scale one part of the system, it doesn't actually mean that you need to, ultimately need to separate them. It can often be the, the right thing to do, but that's it. So what kind of Spring support do you get on that level? It's basically um, like Spring Boot, uh, the, the Maven and Gradle plugins, they allow you to build runnable artifacts out of the box, right? So runnable jars um, that just require you to have a machine running that has a JVM, basically. So you deploy literally everywhere a JVM is available. JVM 17, as you've just learned in the keynote today. Uh, but just recently, not recently, but for, uh, for quite a while, we also support building Docker images with the, pl with the, the build plugins out of the box. Um, there's support coming for building native images. So all of that is already baked in. So all the kind of infrastructure that you need to, to build some, uh, a process. Um, and for the particular challenges that come from the distribute, uh, distributed nature, so in case you decide, okay, I want to comprise my system of multiple processes, then um, these challenges are um, off, uh, hopefully made uh, less hard for you by the Spring Cloud projects, right? The uh, service discovery, uh, gateways, all these kind of stuff that, that, that's in there. All right. So let's have a look at an individual process. How can we actually structure that, right? Um, so we could have one or we could have, um, uh, we could have have the process comprised of one artifact or of multiple ones, right? So the question basically is, do we want individual build modules or not? Um, and again, that's, uh, or the, the step we basically take here is we kind of have decided at this point that we're going to go with Java, like for, uh, for the purpose of this talk, and um, slightly more specific with Spring Boot. I mean, there's a, couple, a bit of uh, Spring Boot specific stuff in here, but most of the stuff that's coming immediately is um, like would be suitable if you have to uh, use a, a different um, framework technology. So within the artifact, like what what are the, the means to actually provide like or separate the inside from the outside, right? So one thing is by separating um, your your process arrangement into different artifacts. Um, you already get control over who can see what through the build mechanism, right? Because you describe my module A has a dependency on my module B um, and not module C because you just don't declare that dependency, then you, by definition, don't have access to that, um, to that build module and that code contained in that during the compilation step. It's a different story for uh, the runtime because at runtime, at least if you're on the class path, um, like, it's basically a global thing. Uh, the Java module system helps with that, right? So you can, for each, um, uh, for each artifact, for each build module, you basically define, again, the inside and the outside, uh, again, by exposing only certain packages. Similarly with, with, with OpenJP, uh, with OSGI. That's kind of the thing. On the interaction um, aspect, we're kind of back to, or not we're back, we're using basically Fun Java fundamentals, right? We have classes, we create object instance from instance, instances from that, and due to the virtues of Spring, we kind of get, we get access to them, right? If, if they're Spring components, we can just like get them dependency injected, and we can actually call them, right? Uh, what we can also do is we can publish application events in our application context, and that would then trigger the invocation of event listeners uh, that we have registered. Um, there's a crucial difference here. Uh, if you refer to a spring bean and uh, you would actually like to call a method on it, then that spring bean has to be available at least at the point in time when you call the method. Right? Usually, if you follow like general spring team advice, you 
uh, inject the, the other, the reference from the other module, for example, you inject that into a constructor, and then it's even required when you construct your, let's say, all the beans of your module. Um, but you can, there's like tweaks where you can get that to uh, be lazy, basically, or you can uh, bootstrap the thing and only require the bean to be present when you invoke the method. But it actually is required to be there at some point, right? With events, it's totally different. You just publish them and then you press it, kind of be done. And this is stuff I'm, we're going to talk about a lot tomorrow. Um, we need to actually, like if we decide to split up the artifacts, we need to assemble them at, at some point, right? It could be like an additional module that just has a dependency on basically everything we want to like comprise our process of. Or we could have a build job that basically brings together uh, the individual jars. Um, and it, that kind of also um, enables us to still ship quote unquote, individual releases, right? There's nothing preventing you from, let's say you have like five teams that um, maintain five different artifacts and they're all, all deployed into a quote unquote monolith, then there's nothing wrong with just having a CI job and one team basically building, uh, releasing a new version of their artifact and the CI job picking that, that thing up, building a new combined process and just running it, right? You're basically reusing the old versions, the already existing versions of the other team's artifacts. Um, of course, that requires API stability, um, compatibility between the APIs, but in fact, that is actually um, kind of verified if you're coding to other API, to, to Java APIs, that's verified through the Java compiler, right, to, 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 to a large degree. Whereas when, with, with processes and HTTP APIs, there's always this kind of attention of okay, how do I actually build an HTTP API that doesn't break any clients as soon as I change something. So that, that higher degree of coupling is, we can actually use that to our, to our benefit here. Right. A downside of that is our internal structure um, is kind of becoming externally visible, right? Is there, is there enough value in using a single artifact from the overall arrangement by itself? Um, do we actually recombine the artifacts in different ways? Like for one customer, we deploy those 10 of the 15 artifacts we have, and for another one, we uh, deploy a different set. If that's, uh, if that's uh, the case in your, uh, in your scenario, then that's a good idea to do that, but otherwise, there's also cost associated to it, right? Having to maintain different build, uh, main different build scripts and whatnot. Right. So, as I said, you can align teams on, on artifacts, but uh, I've mentioned that already. There's a bit of bit more of, of, of challenges uh, integrated. They're not as isolated from each other anymore because still everything at some point needs to compile together, and um, yeah, that's that's kind of thing. Same for for uh, repositories, right? Uh, technological freedom is not entirely gone, right? We're using the JVM after all, and um, there's like a giant breadth of, of libraries out there. So it's not like, oh, we all of a sudden need to send emails around and then we're kind of stuck with, oh, we actually should have done this in whatever other technology, right? Of course, um, if you, let's say, want to do some kind of machine learning or anything uh, where the Python space, for example, is pretty pretty strong, and that's not, that's not, uh, not gonna, gonna be possible in, in that kind of arrangement. Um, still, like different kind of, using different kinds of languages like Kotlin, Java in parallel is theoretically possible, but yeah. Composable and CI, I've mentioned that already. Um, for, the, for the Spring support on that level, um, Spring Boot dependency management is often an over, uh, underlooked, over, under, overlooked, under, underappreciated, definitely, a feature of the Spring, entire Spring Boot feature set. Um, right, being able to have artifacts that depend on certain technological aspects, so I could basically split up artifacts for having my web dependencies only for the my web API artifacts or what have you. And the Spring Container itself is actually even, is also helpful in the ability to actually distribute or, or separate our artifacts because we can set up component scanning in a way that it would eventually find all the components that we declared in individual artifacts potentially with some tricks even for different packages, but uh, by default, if you just agree on the same base package, then you can just magically, magically, quote unquote, you can just combine the, the artifacts and they would, the, the components declared in each of those would be, um, would be found without any kind of 
oh, I need to find, uh, build my own discovery mechanism or something like that. So the packages, um, to, to uh, slowly come to an end, the packages um, comprise artifacts, of course. Usually there's not, I, I've hardly seen artifacts that comprise, consist of a single artifact. I think, and I think Lucas Eder, the guy from Juke, um, is pretty proud of himself um, having, for Juke having very little packages and it works quite well for him, so it's not, I'm not going, to, I'm not making fun of that. It's kind of, it's just that it doesn't seem to be the usual case for, for applications. And it's kind of the same, uh, Michael mentioned that already here. And it's often kind of under, thought of packages as modules are often under thought of. Uh, visibility modifiers are a very powerful tool to actually um, yeah, restrict the surface of the things that you can connect to, and by that, the surface of the things that you can uh, illegally connect to, right? So you can basically restrict uh, the, the, the surface of, 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 your, of your APIs. Of course, this becomes slightly more tricky as soon as the number of packages grows, or if you wanna, let's say, Packages are not hierarchical by nature, so uh, if you have sub-packages and sub-packages, then they all need to expose their types um, in, uh, to be able to be visible from other packages, and that's kind of, the visibility modifiers become hardly usable pretty quickly. Again, bean references, object invocations, event bus, I've mentioned that for artifacts, it's kind of the same, the, the packages don't, don't change that. If we have multiple packages, then we actually need to make, um, types public for them to be visible in from other packages. And we don't have much control about who we can actually expose them to. There's a bit of stuff in the Java module system for that, but um, we're going to have a look at, uh, tomorrow I'm, I'm going to conquer that topic um, as well a bit. Um, it's unlikely that you will actually align teams to that. So having a single artifact, a single project, and multiple teams working on it, it's more for the, or it's, it's becomes quite useful if you have a team that builds a, a rather small application at first or a part of, the, of an application that comprises of, of three or four different modules that's then packaged into an artifact or a process and then interacts with others. Uh, yeah, separate requirements, um, likely not, um, uh, not possible. So within the chosen JVM stack, there is, um, yeah, as I said, again, choice of language, the same in, different, in, in the same artifact is kind of, is, is a bit tricky, right? Mixing, for example, Java and Kotlin in the same artifact is possible, but it's not the nicest experience in the first place. Right? Um, we can, in, in a standard Spring Boot app, we usually run all the packages that our boot app comprises of at once, right? There is support for the horizontal, uh, for horizontal slicing, so you can test the web layer individually, but it's basically what Michael said, right? It's, it's the, driven by technical layering. And um, we're going to see, um, especially tomorrow, uh, how we can actually flip that by 90 degrees and have the same thing, run a subset of packages of our Spring application, and by that, align our tests with that. So have kind of module-specific tests. Run the tests for the customer module. Run the tests for the order module, right? Stuff that, if you want to achieve that, so far have, ha or have driven, um, users and developers to, uh, let's say, more process-oriented split up, but it's all going to be possible with, with monolithic arrangements as well. Right? So again, spring component scanning and the configuration layout, so you can have spring configuration classes in different packages and they would all assemble at, at runtime. Right? So just to round this off, um, we can, like, now that we have the building blocks and we can have an idea on like what the criteria are for the different for the different levels. In what kind of cardinality could we arrange them? Right, a, a usual monolithic arrangement looks like this. The system boundary is basically the process boundary, and within that we just have different modules. Hopefully, right. There's no strong guards between the modules usually, and that's why they often kind of degrade and, and become harder to maintain. We could arrange that slightly different. We could have a couple of processes like, and, and a couple of mod, uh, modules in that. And the usual uh, arrangement you find is the highly distributed nature where you have a, a, an individual process um, containing a single model. That's what we usually see as implemented as, or what we see called the microservices architecture. 
Um, if you, that picture didn't actually take um, the packages into account. So if you um, zoom into one of these like, uh, like tiny cells from the, from, the, from the middle approach and put the package groups into, into the arrangement, we get another layer of where we can actually apply modularity and that's what we're, what we're going, to, uh, going to look into, right? So the, there's a new R&D project from the, in, the, in the spring space called Modulus that basically um, gives you a convention to map packages to modules. Um, there's some verif verification, access verification uh, built into it, um, test support for Spring Boot, and uh, some documentation stuff that I'm uh, just going to skip over, right? So you have your Spring Boot application, and then instead of add Spring Boot test, you go ahead and use add module test, and it would basically just bootstrap all the code in that very module A package there and a bit of documentation that we can derive from the overall arrangement. If you're interested in that, yeah, um, we'll have two more talks tomorrow, you know that. And since time is running out, um, so we just have five seconds left, Literally. we just wanna say thank you very much. Um, we'll be around at the conference for more talks, chats, questions, and so on. And thanks for your time. <laughs>